Well, thank you very much for coming. It's always flattering for me to imagine all you folks taking time out from what you would otherwise have been doing to come and listen to what I have to say. I want to thank Occidental College and the Dean who made this possible together with Dick and Sharon from Los Angeles Progressive as well as the ACLU and all the others that have already been thanked uh, for bringing me here. Um, I thought I might begin by telling you a little bit about um, what has been happening to me so you have a sense not only of what I'm doing but also a sense of what's happening in the United States. And I do this because I want you to feel better about this political approach you're going to get from me than you might already feel. So here's some indexes. I never did a radio program in my life before March of 2011. In March of 2011, WBAI, a Pacifica station in New York City, asked me, since I live in New York City, to do a radio program about the economic crisis. Uh, so I began a weekly program trying to explain what was going on from a critical perspective, which is the same perspective I've had pretty much um, most of my adult life, but which until recently was something I couldn't speak about very easily in most auditoriums or most settings because my audience within a few minutes would become very uncomfortable, <laughs> uh, feeling as though I were doing something that might cause somebody to bite them or to take down their names or somehow make life difficult. And I could feel that. I've been a teacher all my life. You can feel it when your students are not happy with what they're getting. Uh, but I did the best I could. Uh, and then I did this radio program trying to explain it. And here I am, um, not even four years later, and the program is now on 42 stations across the United States, including Houston, Tampa, Denver, New York, Moscow, Idaho, <laughs> Peoria, Illinois, Vancouver, and we just got this week Brighton in England. So uh, something is going on that you should be thinking about that that would have happened and I never spent one minute or one dime to make that happen. They all came to me because they want this kind of critical programming for their stations. Something is going on. About this trip, I speak here tonight. I just came on the airplane this afternoon. Uh, New York City, when I left it, was covered with ice at 22 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm a little, my body is still reacting to the warmth here. Uh, so I speak here tonight. Tomorrow I speak at the Musicians Union Hall on Vine Street uh, as a benefit for KPFK. The following night I do another benefit, but this one in Delhi Hall in Santa Ana. I leave Friday for the Bay Area where I do three more talks. Two in Berkeley, one for KPFA, the station up there in the First Congregational Church of Berkeley, which is the largest auditorium the city has, where I've done this before. And then I end up in the Sonoma Community Center speaking to the folks in the wine country who've brought me up there. In each and every case, they brought me. I didn't solicit it. I didn't look for it. It is something that audiences want to hear. Okay. I do this twice a month, east, west, north, and south. If I had more time and didn't have 50 other things to do, I'd probably be traveling perpetually. I turn down three invitations for every one that I accept. I now bunch them together like the ones I'm doing here in California because otherwise I couldn't see as many audiences in the trips as when I can bunch them together. So I am, for example, going up into Maine to do two or three universities there, Vermont, the, the Boston area, uh, Denver, Minnesota. I can't keep them all straight. 
I now am an enterprise. You are not looking at a person, you're looking at an enterprise. It's called a 501c3, which means we are tax exempt under government law. It's called Democracy at Work, the name of our organization. I have one full-time and five part-time people that work with me, and that's just because there's no other way to get a radio program. I'm on television in New York City now also. We're moving into more and more television. It's enormous, and it's all fed by an enormous explosion of interest in this kind of analysis. And this is important, please, to understand, because you, like me, come out of a country that for 50 years of the Cold War and after was afraid to think or talk about these things in the way that I do. And now we can. For those 50 years, we had every right to say it was impossible. The media were against us, the government was against us, the people were afraid, and it was very hard for us to make headway. That's not the case anymore. And the irony is, if the left in the United States doesn't make enormous breakthroughs in the next period, it's on us, because we can now. I am the proof of that, and that's why I tell you about it. I am finding in every corner of the country I'm going to Tampa. <laughs> I don't mean to be critical of the folks in Tampa, but I'm going to Tampa because the radio station down there, which carries my program, WMNF, now thinks it can fill an auditorium with the people who want to hear this. And to make no mistake and to make it really clear, I am a critic of capitalism. I think the system is over. And that's very hard. It's hard for me, it's hard for you. I understand that. But not to look in the face of that reality and not to begin to think what it means, that would be silly. And because other people are afraid to think it or say it is precisely why it's important that I do that and that you just think about what it is I have to say. Last introduction. Two weeks ago, in a small country, savaged by what we call austerity, country of Greece, something extraordinary happened. And I want to briefly make sure you all know what it was, because it's all about what is going to happen in the United States, too. May not come out the same way, but something like that is going on. It's already very advanced in the country of Spain, which is the likely next place where this is going to happen. But it's happening everywhere. What happened? Very important. For most of the last 30 or 40 years, Greece was governed by two political parties remarkably like the Republicans and Democrats. <laughs> However, they had different names, because it's Europe. So the Republican Party there is called New Democracy. And the Democratic Party is called the Greek Socialist Party. That's just different European words for a similar reality. And they did the two-step shuffle. A few years, one party was the prime minister, and then a few years, the other party was, and then they handed it back. Very gentlemanly, very nice, very friendly, no trouble. A little bit like... Republicans and Democrats, with a little theatrical name-calling to spice it up, but nothing really important. And after the name-calling, everybody goes out and has a drink. And so the Greeks did it too. The two parties together got two-thirds to three-quarters of the vote. Every election, the two parties got that proportion. They didn't get 100% because the Greeks, like most Europeans, have multiple political parties. They actually believe, <laughs> backward people that they are, that one ought to have political choice. They want the freedom of choice of a lot of different parties to choose among. We here in America, of course, we know better, two's enough. <laughs> when we go to the supermarket, we want 47 brands of soup. <laughs> we want a lot of choice in soup. But in political parties, two's enough. Two's enough, but who needs it? By the Europeans being backward folks, they like a lot of parties. The Greeks always had a lot of parties. 
What happened two weeks ago is stunning. The two parties that used to be in charge together got a quarter of the vote. The middle of Greek politics, the consensus for normality that had become the law, vanished. The Greek Socialist Party is not barely there. It shot itself in the foot. Greek Socialism is set back for decades because they administered austerity like everybody else. And who took their place? The extremes. A right-wing party called Golden Dawn in that country and a left-wing party called Syriza. But what is very interesting is that the vast bulk of the people in the middle who'd had it with their Republican and Democrats went to the left. And they voted in Syriza. Syriza got close to half the vote. In a country like Greeks, that's a mandate. One party never gets that many votes. This isn't just a defeat of the middle. It's a mandate sweep victory for the left. The left. Over the years, I've worked occasionally with a number of European economists. And one of the ones I worked with on occasion, and even brought to meetings like this with me in New York, was a young Greek professor named Yanis Varoufakis. He's now the finance minister. That really is a little bit like Greece doing what would here mean I'd be the finance minister. <laughs> and you can imagine how much will have changed were that to be the case. Yanis Varoufakis is the finance minister. Syriza is in power. Alex Tsipras is the new leader of this country, uh, prime minister. This is a party, many of whose people like best the following slogan, Greece can do better than capitalism. Wow. We're not talking about a little fringe. Five years ago, Syriza got 4% of the vote. We're talking about a left-wing coalition. The word Syriza is a coalition coalition of left-wing social movements and political groups. That's what it is. That means, if I may be so bold, that institutions in Greece, not that different, say, from the ACLU, got together with other groups like that, made a political party, and said, we're going to go to the mass of people and say, if you've had it with austerity, Vote for us. And an overwhelming population said, will do and did. Commitments of Syriza raise the minimum wage by a lot. Restore the pensions that were taken away from the Greek people over the last four years. Stop selling assets of the government into privatization. This will make sure, for those of you that are concerned, that the next time you visit the Parthenon, you will still not be able to get any McDonald's there. <laughs> Which, if you've ever seen the Parthenon, is, is a good, good thing, by and large. I tell you the story because I want you to understand that that kind of political approach not only can win, it has won. I don't know what's going to happen in Greece. No one else does either. The greatest struggle now, and I can see from your faces that I should spend another two, three minutes before I go into what I plan to say, to tell you about it, because you're interested, and that's very good. The first problem Mr. Varoufakis, the new finance minister, has is to get out from under the enormous debts that Greeks has to the European country, the European Commission, the European Central Bank, and the International Monetary Fund. Why does Greece owe that much money to them? Because over the last four years, you read in American newspapers that Greece was bailed out. No, that's not what happened. These European institutions that are representative of the Europe as a whole lent $300 billion to Greece. That's true. But what did they lend the money for? 
so that Greece could pay back the private banks in France, Germany, Britain, and the United States to whom they were indebted. Greeks didn't get bailed out. French, German, British, and American banks got bailed out. They got back everything rather than what they would have had to do is come to a deal with Greece. What kind of a deal? The same deal that has to be worked out every time a debtor can't pay his or her bills. Every court in the United States now has those cases in front of it. Every court everywhere does because people who borrow find themselves unable to pay back all the time. And the courts come in and they make a deal. They work it out. And part of the pain of the adjustment is in the borrower's camp. He can't pay back. And part of it is in the lender's camp. Why? Because in economics, I'm a professor of economics, this is what all the textbooks teach. The burden of responsibility in a loan is on the creditor. It is the job of the creditor to assess the riskiness of the borrower, the capacity of the borrower to repay, the condi conditions that apply and that may make it more or less difficult. A lender is not supposed to lend to somebody unless they have made clear by their own due diligence, it's called, that the borrower is capable. And when the debt can't be paid back, it's prima facie evidence that the work of the creditor was faulty. Therefore, you punish the creditor as well as the debtor. In Europe, the game is being played that somehow paying back the entire debt is entirely on the borrower. They keep saying that because they're counting on the people of the world not to know what I've just told you, which is that's not the way this is handled. But it's worse. They want the Greeks to pay, even though the Greeks say, we can't. If we have to pay it back, we will have to continue damaging the economy of Greece. And to give you an idea, one quarter of the people are unemployed. That's what it was in 1933 at the worst moment of the U.S. Depression. One quarter of the people are unemployed. One out of four Greeks are unemployed, which means every single Greek family has somebody, because Greek families are large, that's unemployed, often many. The Greek minimum wage, which was lousy to begin with, has been reduced. Greek public employees, which is the largest group of employees, their public sector is larger than the private sector in Greece, have suffered a 40% cut in salary, 40% from 2010. Their pensions have been cut, their medical, they had a national medical insurance, like all European countries, has been savaged. It is a country that has really been whacked around on a scale that we don't not yet know. Notice, please, the word yet. This will only get worse if we have to pay the debts. Because how does a country like Greece pay all these debts? By using money that used to pay public employees who produce public services for people, but now you have to use that money not to hire those people and not to produce those services, but to pay off whom? Basically, you've already paid off the private banks. Now you're going to repay the governments and the governmental institutions that saved those private banks. And the Syriza people say, we're not going to do that. We are not going to do it. Not us, not ever. And the Germans, because they are taking the commanding role in Europe, they are now the most powerful country. They are the leader of Europe. Something they never had before, because before it was only a dream in the minds of people like uh, Adolf Hitler who tried to do it with military weapons and couldn't. But he didn't need to. Capitalism would do it for him. And so the Germans, led by Angela Merkel, have said that Greeks must pay. They must adhere to their obligations. Last point for this, so you get the irony of it. In 1953, it's so important to know your history. It's so dangerous if you don't. In 1953, Germany was reeling under its debts. Debts it had incurred because of World War I and World War II. Germany had the very bad taste of starting those two wars 
That would have been okay, but also losing them. <laughs> this was not okay. And in the great wisdom of people at that time, whoever lost the war was required to make payments. So the Germans owned a, owed a ton of money. And in 1953, they went to their creditors, France, Britain, and the United States, both the banks and the governments, and said, look, we can't rebuild from the war. That would not have been an argument that would have made much sense to your former enemy. But they had a good argument. You want us to be a good ally against the Soviet Union? You want us to be a good part of the Cold War? We have to be able to rebuild. And this debt is killing us. So they met in London to discuss it. They started in February of 1953, and they met all through the summer. And in August of 1953, they agreed to the following deal. It's called the London Agreement. Look it up. Nowadays with Google, it all takes 12 seconds. I am not paid by Google. I didn't uh, say that for that reason. In August of 1953, here was the deal. The United States, France, and Britain, ready? forgave Germany 50% of its debt written off. And the other 50% was stretched out to become a 30-year loan, meaning the amount of money Germany would have to come up with each year was reduced to next to nothing. The Germans demanded, begged, and got what they now want to deny Greece. The only word for that is disgusting. But you will not hear this story in the American press, or very rarely. European press is full of it, but not here. A big struggle is being waged. And here's the double irony. If the Europeans insist that the Greeks pay, the Greeks will have two steps, and only two. They cannot cave in. The American press writes as though, well, they may cave in. I mean, they may, but it will be self-destruction. If they cave in, they will destroy themselves just like the Greek Socialist Party before them, which voted, got voted in to be anti-austerity and then ended up administering austerity and is now dead. Another country where exactly the same thing happened, France. Over the last two years in France, the Socialist Party won the presidency kicked out Sarkozy, brought in Hollande. They won the, the French Senate. The Socialists haven't controlled the Senate for 50 years. They have the President, they have the Senate, and they have the National Assembly. The Socialists controlled everything on a campaign of anti-austerity. They got in, and they administered austerity. And now Mr. Hollande gets the lowest uh, popularity rating. He's looking up at the rating of George Bush. <laughs> That's low. That's really low. He's finished, and probably the Socialist Party of France will take decades to come back if it ever does. So Syriza knows this. They can't do that. That is literally self-destruction. So what are they going to do? They're going to say, we can't pay, and we won't pay. The Europeans, if they're going to not bluff, are going to then say, OK, we're not giving you another nickel. Well, the, the Greek government can't function if they don't get anything because they have no way to do that. Or do they? They do. There's only one way left. If you want to stick to your guns and you can't get help from Europe, then the only way to get the wherewithal to take care of the mass of the Greek people is to take it away from the Greek elite. To take it from the rich and give it to everybody else. The nightmare of modern capitalist society is being brought by the mechanisms of capitalism itself. It's giving these folks no choice. And if you see an agreement over the next few weeks between the Europeans and Syriza, it's because they figured it out, that they are better off giving Syriza, writing off those debts, than trying to push in any other way, because that's even scarier than writing off the debts. Because if the Greeks could pull off 
removing the wealth from the rich to help everybody else, what awful thoughts could enter the minds of people everywhere else, ah, even in the United States. What an interesting solution. Okay, now let's turn to the United States. We did something like it. Mr. Tsipras likes to say that Syriza is just doing what FDR did. So I want to begin by again reminding you about a little history. This time it's our history, FDR. It's 1933. We've got a collapse of capitalism, worse even than the one we've had since 2008. It's really bad. 25% of our people are unemployed. Poverty is everywhere. You know, many of you read, I don't know, uh, John Steinbeck, Grapes of Wrath, Mice or Men, remember those descriptions? Eh? Well, a lot of people were like that. A lot of people waited for the coal car to come by on the freight train because little bits of coal would fall off and the children would go and get them because they're the only way you keep warm, etc., 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 etc. Much good American literature was produced out of that misery. But something interesting happened. Again, Greece is an interesting example. The American people reacted to that misery, the collapse from the roaring 20s into the miserable 30s, by getting angry at rich people and at corporations, big time. Starting in 1933, millions of Americans who had never been in a union, who came from families where no one had ever been in a union, joined unions, was the greatest organizing drive in American history. Unions have never achieved that before, and they've never achieved anything like it since. In a matter of two or three years, millions of Americans joined a union to save them from the horrors of the Depression. Working together with the unions, organizing, were two socialist parties, not just one, two a kind of reformist, middle-of-the-road one, and a, what we now call Trotskyite one. The Socialist Party and the Socialist Workers Party, for those of you who know your history. And also working with them was the American Communist Party. Big, powerful organizations, all of them. And the combination, wow, the Communist, the Socialist, and the CIO, it was called, the Movement to Organize Workers, that's where the AFL-CIO comes from, the CIO part. And they mobilized millions of Americans. And they went and talked with Roosevelt, and they had a conversation. Frank, they said, <laughs> we here represent millions and millions of people. Uh, we like you. You're a Democrat. And compared to Republicans, we probably like any Democrat, but nonetheless, we like you. We like you. And... Uh, we want to support you, but you've got to do something about the mass suffering of the American people. And we've got to tell you in all honesty that if you don't, we've got a lot of people who want to do here what those Russians did over in the Soviet Union. And this is 1933. The, the Soviet Revolution is a memory. It wasn't that long before that. And Roosevelt was a very smart politician. He knew they were not bluffing. They represented millions of people. They had mobile. They had done something that nobody expected them to do, organize all these industries. Go back if you have a chance to go to a library and look at the, the cities across America that were scenes of worker demonstrations every day. Minneapolis and Philadelphia and Chicago and New York and Trenton and on and on and on. This was scary time for business. So Roosevelt listened and he said, okay, I'm going to make you a deal. I'm going to go talk to the rich and the corporate leaders. Roosevelt knew them since he had gone to school with them, intermarried with them and all the rest. So these were friends of his. And I'll see what I can do. And he met with the businesses. And he said to the businesses, basically, uh, I've got to take care of all these poor people. Uh, and I advise you to help me because the only way I can take care of them is if you give me the money because it's a depression. We don't have any money. Nobody's paying taxes. Everybody's unemployed. All the businesses are shut down. The government has no money, like today. So we have no money. The only way I can take care of the people is if you give me the money. 
And I advise you to do it. Because if you don't, those people are going to make sure you don't have any money to give me. <laughs> it's going to be over. Half of them were not convinced at all. That's the forerunner of what we call today the Koch brothers. <laughs> no, no, seriously, that's where that comes from. The other half agreed with Roosevelt. They were scared. With half of the business community and the rich in his pocket, he went back to the coalition of the CIO, the socialist, and the communist, and he said, OK, I got a deal. We can, we can do business. I am going to get money from the rich and the corporations, and I'm going to help you. I'm going to do it. But you've got to promise me something. Stop talking about revolution. Put that away. If you keep doing that, I can't make a deal. I can't get the rich and the... That's the deal. And they all agreed. The CIO bought it, the socialists bought it, and the communists bought it. They said they didn't, and not all of them agreed, but they bought it. And what did Roosevelt do? Now you can see why Mr. Tsipras in Syriza is paying attention. 1933, let's go real fast. Roosevelt gets up and says, I'm going to create social security. What? In the middle of a depression when there's no money, you're about to tell everybody who's over 65, here, here's a check every month for the rest of your life. Yup, that's what he did. And before he, people could even deal with the enormity, we had no social security before that, he announced the unemployment compensation system. We had never had a program of giving money to people who are out of work for a year or two every week. The government had no money, it was the Great Depression. He said, I'm going to give the old people who are over 65 a check every month and the unemployed, of whom there were millions, a check every week. I'm going to raise the minimum wage, which he did. In fact, he established the minimum wage. We didn't have one before that. I'm going to make a minimum wage, and he made it nice and high. In real terms, higher than it is now. But then came the big one, as if these weren't big enough. I said the president, went on the radio. I am going to tell you, the American people, the following. If the private sector, he didn't use the word capitalist, that word sticks in Americans' throats. They can't <laughs> quite get it out, which is why I say it so often. So if the private sector can't provide work to the millions of Americans who ask only to have a job, then of course, as if it were self-evident, I, as president, have to do that. And between 1934 and 1941, he created and filled 15 million jobs in the United States, which the government paid for. They paid the salaries. Some of you visit the national parks. Many of those were built by those people, and so on. And where did he get the money? Because this is the best part. <laughs> he taxed corporations and the rich. I gotta say it again. In an American audience, most of you will pretend you didn't hear what I said. <laughs> he taxed corporations and the rich. A lot! That's where the money came from. Because that's where the money always is to solve these social problems. You know it, I know it, and unfortunately, they know it. But he did. Let me give you just a couple of examples. The top income tax bracket that Roosevelt was in favor of. Well, let's deal with the, the top he ever asked for. State of the Union message, 1944. We're in a war. In a war. He sends a message, Roosevelt president, to the Congress. I propose that the top bracket, the top income tax rate on the richest people be, ready, 100%. <laughs> See, you're laughing because you don't know your own history. What does that mean? Here's what it means. Every dollar over 25000 a year, that was the cutoff then, that would be about 380000 390000 a year now. Every dollar over 25000 you get, you don't get. We get it. 
100%, we take every dollar. The president proposed a maximum income. That's what that means. The maximum income you get is 25. And if you get more than that, you ain't getting it. He sent the message. The Republicans, doing what the Republicans are supposed to, went ballistic. <laughs> Yelling, screaming, I don't know, until a compromise was reached between the Republicans and the Democrats, which they then sent to the president who signed it, making the top bracket in 1944 94%. Every dollar over 25 you got, you got to keep six cents, and the other 94 cents went to the government of the United States. Republicans supported it, Democrats supported it. Even after Roosevelt died, for the next 20 years, the top brackets within the 90%, 91, 92, and so on. Even in the 1970s, it was in the 70%. What is it today? 39%. That's a tax cut. That's a tax cut no working class person could imagine, let alone enjoy. We've taxed the rich. Here's another statistic for you. In 1945, end of the war, for every dollar in income tax that the federal government earned by taxing individuals, it got $1.50 in taxing corporations. The total take from corporations was 50% more than the total take from individuals. Today, the same proportion for every dollar taxed in individuals, the corporations pay 25 cents. That's where it is. Oh, that's a tax cut. That is a wonderful tax cut. Uh, not for you, but for them. The last 50 years have been then what? Rolling back the tax on corporations and shifting it to individuals, and rolling back the tax on rich individuals, and putting it instead on all of you. So on behalf of corporations and the rich, I want to say to all of you, thank you. <laughs> Very kind of you. Wonderful. All Syriza wants to do is play this game again, but with a different outcome. They want to go the other way. They want to tax the rich, of whom there are many. Not so long ago, a widowed wife of an American president married into one of those Greek families, didn't she? And that was not only because he was stunningly beautiful, he wasn't. <laughs> but as she once said to a reporter who asked her how could she marry such a person, he was so short. She said, he looks much taller when he's standing on his money. <laughs> she was honest, if not, if not diplomatic. What happened over the last 30 years is really what I want to finish this up with. The United States shifted in the last 30 to 40 years radically away from everything Roosevelt did. It's as if the last 30 or 40 years could be described by the phrase, roll back the New Deal. Undo all that was done by, by this story of Roosevelt that I just told you. And we really know why. The business community hated this. They had to pay these enormous taxes to take care of what Mitt Romney called, you know, the 47% of moochers in our society. They were furious at these taxes. The rich were furious at paying 91%. Even if they got out of a lot of that with clever tax accountants, they still had to pay a lot to take care of, of I don't know, uh, you or me. They didn't want that. They knew the problem wasn't Franklin Roosevelt. By 1945, the man was dead, so that clearly he wasn't the problem. But they knew it was never him. It was that coalition of unions and socialists. and co That was the problem. They knew that if you took away that political powerhouse, the ideas would never have come up. And you know, we know they're right because in the depression we've had since 2008, that coalition isn't there. And that's why Obama is not Roosevelt. 
There's nothing to make Obama be Roosevelt. And that's not an accident, and that's not a mystery. As soon as the war was over, the business community, the ones who had never been persuaded by Roosevelt, went to work to destroy that coalition. They began with the weakest link, the Communist Party. And they turned them from a militant organizing thing, which is what it had been in the 30s and 40s, into the horrible agent of a foreign power. And you know the rest. It's in all of our minds, whether we think it is or not. It's right there. It's in our culture. We demonized them. They were evil, bad. We killed a couple of them, didn't we? The Rosenbergs, for those of you who have never heard these stories. We killed, we executed them as agents precisely of Moscow. And as soon as the communists were wiped out, put in jail, deported, all the things we did to them, we did a very peculiar thing, although not surprising if you understand it. We went after the next weakest link, the socialists. And the way that we did it in this country was by saying, socialists are just like communists. They just spell it differently. <laughs> you know, I used to wonder since I'm the child of immigrants, my mother was German, my father was French, and so, you know, if you grow up in a household with other languages, it's a different way of, of living. And I go back, because I have family in France, I go back and I spend a lot of time there, I speak those languages, and it took me a while to understand, if you go to Europe, France or Germany, you say communist and socialist, people know exactly, they're very different and they can explain to you what the difference is. Whereas here in America, my students, when I ask them, what's the relationship between communist, socialist, terrorist, Marxist, and anarchist? They all raise their hands and say, that's easy, synonyms. <laughs> well, and I used to think, are they dumb? Or did they didn't learn anything? No, 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 that's nothing to do. That's what we were taught. A whole generation was taught. This is all the same. And today we, we know how to extend it. We add Muslim. Well, you know, why not? Makes as much sense as the other things being synonyms. It's kind of nutty, but it comes out of our culture. So you destroyed the socialists by saying they were, you know, more or less communists. And that left the labor movement. And if I had a piece of chalk, I'd show you what happened to the labor movement in the last 50 years, and it's a straight line down into the toilet. Today, the private sector, for those of you that do not know, in the private sector, which is the major part of our economy, the percentage of workers who are either members of a union or represented by a union is 6.7%. The other 93.3% of private sector workers are not represented by a union. So the next time you read a newspaper article that talks about our economy with big business over here and big labor, you're talking about someone who lives on another planet. <laughs> because that's make-believe. In their wildest dreams, the unions do not have that kind of power, and never did, but not now, after a 50-year uninterrupted decline. Bottom line, the unions are small and weak, we don't have a socialist party or parties worth the name, and our communist party, if it vaguely exists, has no influence. The coalition that brought the success in the 30s is gone, destroyed, and not by accident or inadvertence, but by intent. And that's why in this collapse of capitalism, the second in 75 years, we don't have anything like that. We've just gone through seven years of really bad unemployment with no significant Republican or Democratic leader ever talking about public employment, which would be a way to solve the problem. What way? The way we used the last time. It's our history. It's like a collective amnesia. It's amazing. It's not that we debated it, bro. It's as if it never happened. It never happened. And taxing corporations and the rich, this is like, I don't know, attacking motherhood and apple pie. It's unthinkable. But it's our history. And by the way, when you suggest it to people, I've done this in Washington, 
to congressmen and women uh, the couple times they made the mistake of bringing me there. Uh, and they said, we can't do that. That'll be the end of the poli our political careers. Huh. I love to explain to them the one president in American history who really went after the rich and taxed them and really went after the corporations and taxed them was re-elected four times. <laughs> no other president in American history ever came close to that. He's the most popular president we ever had. Let's see. The most popular president was the one who taxed corporations and the rich to give everybody social security, unemployment, and a government job. Hello? Mr. Obama's going out of office not with such a great reputation. I think that's fair to say. He might have done better trying the other direction, following the example of Mr. Roosevelt. I mean, he can't run. By the way, you know why Obama can't run for a third term, because after Roosevelt died, the Republicans pushed through a law that no president can be more than twice, because they didn't want to have that happen again, that another Democrat would get to four terms. That's our history. Wow. Why was it possible, having destroyed the left, destroyed its organization, and not just destroyed the Communist Party, the Socialist Party, and wipe out the labor movement in large part. But along the way, when that was done, something very profound and psychological happened to the American left. And by that, I'm going to be, I'm going to take a chance and say, you. It happened to you. Into the American psyche settled an idea that to get together with other people to build a left alternative program and entity is a fundamentally dangerous thing to do and you probably shouldn't do it. You should probably go home and plant a garden or make some brownies or think about your family or focus on your career. All the things that are part of life, but don't do that. There lies danger. For most of my adult life, when I start talking, people have a sense, uh oh, I know that. That's, uh, uh, I, I need to cook something. <laughs> I have to get out of here because this is toxic. This, and you know, as all psychologists will tell you, the stuff we can't put into words is the stuff that has the greatest hold on us, the stuff we can't be conscious about. This is an unconscious lesson learned of inability to take that seriously. Americans are left-wingers in their sense of being critical as much as any country. That's what I, my career, that's why I opened this evening by telling you about what I'm doing. I'm doing that because the audience for that is here now. And it's becoming more courageous with each passing week. It's wonderful. But it proves that you're here, we're here, we're strong, we're just afraid. Why do Europeans have general, you know, in this last five years, Italy, France, Greece have had general strikes, demonstrations in the street, fighting against austerity, and now Syriza, and, and the, the Syriza, by the way, in, in Spain, if some of you are interested, is something called Podemos. And, and if you follow in the press, when you see stories about Spain and Pod Podemos in Spanish, if I'm not mistaken, is yes, we can, like Mr. Obama. So Podemos, follow it. Uh, there's a young man named Iglesias, who's their leader, uh, and it's extraordinary uh, how they are developing. Whereas Greece is a little country in a corner. Spain is the fourth largest economy in Europe. That's a whole new ball game. Greek Greece owes $300 billion. Spain owes $2 trillion. So we're dealing with a whole nother catalog. Things are moving in Europe on a scale nobody foresaw. And part of the crazy language in Europe is because nobody knows how to react. This was not supposed to happen. Just like it's not supposed to happen here. And the same surprise may be underway. We are afraid. We don't have demonstrations, not because we don't have the view, and not because we don't have the people, but because we don't have the organizations. 
When something happens in Europe, phone call. My family's French. The minute something happens, my family, who are not political, middle of the road French people, they get a call from Henri, who lives across the street in Paris. <laughs> Has to be Henri or Pierre, whichever one you like. Henri or Pierre calls up and he explains to my family, thus and so and thus and so has happened. We need you in the street on Saturday at 9 in the morning. And my family doesn't, doesn't ask for detail. It, just, it goes. It goes because Henri calls once or twice or three times a year, and that's what he's there for. They know he's in whatever party he is. They trust him. They've known him since they were children together, and they've worked. That's called a network. That's an organization. The reason we're behind in this country is because we have to start from scratch. We have to build them anew because the ones we had were destroyed. The anti-communist frenzy after World War II in the United States never worked that well in Europe. Every European country has a communist party. The communist party is part of their public culture. If you sit in front of a television in France on a Sunday morning, you see, you know, like our Meet the Press, you see those television programs. One week they have the head of the Socialist Party, one week the head of the Conservative Party, one week the head of the Fascist Party, one week the head of the Communist Party. You see the Communist Party all the time. It's part of your political culture. In America, to see a person with a communist, you, you wear the horns. <laughs> Some of you saw me on the Bill Maher show this last July when he, he invited me to come and be the opening eight-minute interview. For those of you who missed it, that's also an important sign, isn't it, that Bill Maher would ask someone like me? And he wanted to talk, for those of you who saw it, about Marxism. And since he is a comic, I knew that part of my job was to say whatever I had to say in a humorous vein. So when he asked me, you know, is it true that you are a Marxist? I answered, looking him right in the face, yes. But look, I said, no horns. And the audience liked that. And that was important to change a little bit what might otherwise have developed out of that conversation. I've been on Bill Moyers. I've been on Charlie Rose. I've been on Up With Chris Hayes. I've been on them all, all within the last couple of years. And all is a sign that this kind of conversation is no longer the taboo that it was for 50 years. Every society that has ever existed has produced among its people those who loved it and those who didn't. That's normal and that's healthy. If you wanted to understand, I know I've used this example before, but it works. If you wanted to understand the family that lives up the street from you, and you knew there was mother, father, and two kids, and you knew that one of the kids thought this was the best family, they were so lucky to be born in it, and the other one thought it was a dysfunctional mess, would you, in order to understand the family, would you talk to one kid, either one? Or would you think that the reasonable thing to do is to talk to both children, and then you draw whatever conclusion these conversations lead you to? But you don't, you don't discuss only one. You talk of, you want to hear the critical view. We've had critics of capitalism in our society all the time, but we wouldn't listen. We made them out to be disloyal, evil, scary, dangerous, threatening, all in the interest of not hearing that. That's not a very honorable way of proceeding. It's also self-defeating and dangerous. It gives you a lopsided view. One of the reasons the United States is open to what I am saying now in a way it never was in my lifetime before is that I'm in a sense providing something that has been the repressed content of the last 50 years. And I get a certain opening because a part of people, even people that are conservative, would like to kind of engage this conversation because somewhere they know they always should have. My wife's a psychotherapist. I get the reinforcement of this view because it conforms with her concept of human psychology. What happened in the last 30 years? The country went in the direction you would expect. The left opposition had been crushed. The organizations wiped out. 
And now the business community could come back with a vengeance and undo what had happened in the Great Depression. And boy, did they. From the 71% top income tax bracket on individuals in 1970, it's 39% now. Wow. Corporate profits are taxed at the lowest rate in many, many decades. Wonderful. Regulations removed. Privatization, sell everything. Instead of the post office, we can have FedEx. Wonderful. All of which was spoken that would liberate our economy. What? What? Again, the history. In the 1950s and 60s, the top income tax bracket was in the 90%. We had lower unemployment and faster economic growth than we have now. The story is not we cut taxes on corporations and they really boosted. Uh -uh. We cut taxes on corporations and we went in the toilet as an economy. Our growth is slow. 2014 hour growth, averaged over the whole year, is 2.5%. Economic growth in the People's Republic of China, 7.5%. It's been that way for 20 years. That's why China is now the second economy in the world. They've been growing very f fast. They don't have free enterprise, poor folk. They don't have it. The government takes a heavy hand. And boy, does it pay off for them. I'm not arguing that we, we should be Chinese people or have their economy. But face the reality. We have run an economy in the interest of returning wealth to the rich and the corporations. Every statistic shows it. The top 10%, I know these numbers sometimes get blurry, but they're not complicated. The top 10% of Americans own 90% of the wealth. The other 90% share the other 10%. Got it? It's exact inverse. 10% own 90% of the world, of, of the wealth in this country, and the other 90% of us share the other 10%. The United States used to like to make fun of certain countries, particularly in Latin America, as, quote, banana republics because of this lopsided distribution. We are a banana republic. We have arrived at that exalted state. We can't call other people that name anymore because it bounces right back on us. That's the reality. And what do those people who've taken all the wealth by undoing the liberal programs of the 1930s, what do they do? They're not stupid. They figured something out, which is elemental, and you have to have it in your mind, just like they do. How do you get 10% of the people to own 90% of the wealth in a society that at least gives lip service to universal suffrage? Because then the 90% who don't have anything have the majority of the votes to control the government, and so sooner or later they're going to figure out Gee, we should use our majority in the political realm to undo the inequality that a capitalist economic system has delivered to us. We can use the power of the state to undo the inequality of capitalism. The rich people know that. It doesn't take rocket science. So what have they done? Well, you know what they've done. They bought the political system to make sure it didn't do that. And that works. They make every election a, a money fest, which only they can feed, or they can feed in a disproportionate way. And so the two parties pick people that are acceptable to those wealthy people, because otherwise you have no chance. With the net result that whichever one wins, it really doesn't make much difference, because the, the process is one of, which is logical if I were among those wealthy people. Not only would I unlikely to be here in front of you this evening, but I would have done that too. Of course I would. Because otherwise your wealth position is insecure. And they don't want that. Nobody would. So we are all shocked at our political system. The power of money. Stop. 
That comes right out of this system. Every system of extreme inequality has faced this problem. We're not the first. Now the finish, the last. In the Great Depression, we tried reforms. Minimum wage, public employment, social programs of every kind. But our capitalist system didn't want those. And so, as soon as the crisis was passed, the Great Depression was over, the World War was over, what reasserted itself was an underlying dynamic of capitalism as an economic system. And that dynamic is to produce more and more wealth at one pole and more and more non-wealth at the other. This has been known for a long time, but it was out of the consciousness of the American people. And then a very funny thing happened in the year 2014. An obscure French professor, unknown to the vast majority of Americans, Thomas Piketty, professor in Paris, who has been working for 40 years with an American professor in Berkeley named Emmanuel Saez, S-A-E-Z, and if you go to the Google, you'll see Piketty and Saez. They have their own website where they publish their work for years. Uh, the, um, Saez is a professor of economics at UC Berkeley. So they work together, and they are the go-to people in the profession of economics. People left, right, and center use their work because it is the most developed empirical study of inequality in capitalism. So Piketty writes this 600-page book. It becomes a sensation. Why? For the same reason that I'm running around the country talking. Americans are suddenly really interested to hear what is basically old news. That, here's what Piketty's book does, and I'll save you the trouble. It's 600 pages long. You wouldn't want to read it. He is not a good writer, and the translation is awful. Okay? He's a friend. It's nothing personal. It's, just, it's, it's the reality. Um, People in economics, if you've never met them, and I apologize in advance if there are any of you among them, great writers are rare among them. <laughs> One of the most sophisticated forms of torture known in modern society is what graduate students in economics are required to do, which is read many, many articles by professors of economics, which is worse than root canal work. Okay? Um, I had to go through it, and maybe the students who read my stuff feel that way too, but it was... It was um, it was awful. Here's what Piketty's book says. Capitalism has everywhere, for three, four hundred years that it's been a system in the modern world, has relentlessly produced ever-growing inequality. There it is, documented country after country, period after period. He's a thorough professor. And what does he say? Periodically, uh, it stops. Periodically, it stops becoming un unequal, and it even sometimes gets reversed. And one of the examples is the Great Depression in the United States. He, he talks about that. But he says what happens then is that the, here we go now, the mass of people intervene politically in what capitalism does and say they can't have it anymore, they can't stand it, and they stop and they revolt, and then it gets shaken. But, now Piketty doesn't say this now, it's me entering the story, but the punchline here for me was, if the reformers, like Roosevelt, even the successful ones, like Roosevelt, if they don't change the basic system, then after they put the reform in, the underlying dynamic that Piketty documents comes back and undoes the very reforms that were achieved. This is not an argument not to pursue reforms. Please don't misunderstand me. I support raising the minimum wage. I support changing the bur burden of property taxes. All the things that this courageous a group of people in the ACLU with their interest in economic justice, which I find wonderful to see. I'm in favor of all of that. But there's a lesson we have to learn about it. 
to do reforms in a capitalist system, but to leave the system in place is to leave in place the mechanism that undoes the reform. And you've got to ask yourself then whether it's enough to make a reform that doesn't also change the system to make the reform secure rather than to create the very antipathy. Everything Roosevelt did, however much you applaud it, produced the enemy of that reform. It, it produced the businessman or woman outraged by what had just been done and therefore committed to undo it. It taxed wealthy people who then were furious and went to work to support all of the institutions that have since undone all of that. So the conclusion is, and this is the final thing for me tonight, what do you do to change the system in such a way that the reforms won by the struggles of people, just like those at the ACLU, uh, is trying to build, how, what do you, changes do you do that might enable those to be permanent, to be secure, to be things that people have won that they won't then lose five or ten years down the road? And for me, there's only one answer I know. And it's not the answer you might have expected. My answer is not the answer that traditional critics of capitalism thought would be the solution, which is to have the government do this or that. Have the government take over the enterprise, have the government substitute planning for the market, the things that the Soviet Union, China, and so on did. It's not that. Seems to me what's happened in those two societies, Russia and China, is more a model of what we shouldn't do than what we should do. I think that has to be said as part of facing a reality. So what is it? We have to change the organization of business. That's what we have to do. We have to change the enterprise, the, the institution that produces goods and services. And we have to change it in such a way that conforms to our values, I'm going to explain to you in a minute what I mean, and that will support and secure the reforms that we want. So first, what do I mean? I mean, and I don't know a nicer way to say it, to democratize the enterprise. To bring democracy to the end. What does that mean? It means that the enterprise is a place in our society, just like the community where we live. In the community where we live, we say, nobody should be in a position of power in that community unless we, the people, have the right to put them or take them away from that power. You can't have power unless you are responsible and accountable to the people over whom you exert the power. So in the end, the people exert the power over themselves through you, but not under you. That's what we mean by democracy. Well, if it's a good value for where we live, please explain to me, anybody, why it isn't a good value where we work. And if we did it where we work, it would mean that everyone in an enterprise, the manager, the technical worker, the janitor, all are citizens. They're part of the enterprise. And the decisions of the enterprise are to be made democratically. Everybody has one person, one vote to decide what. What the enterprise produces, how the enterprise produces, where the enterprise produces, and above all, what is done with the profits of the enterprise. We don't have democracy in the enterprise. We have a system in which a tiny group of people, the board of directors of a corporation, 15 to 20 persons on a board. How do you get to be on the board? You're elected by the shareholders. One shareholder, one vote? No, no, no. One share, one vote. You own 10 million shares, you get 10 million votes. You own no shares, you get no votes. 1% of Americans own 75% of the shares. That 1% decides who's on the board of directors. They make all the decisions. Do you have a job or not? What do you get paid? Will your job be moved to China next month? 
Will the profits you help to produce be used in a way that you have any control over? The answer is unambiguous. An enterprise is a fundamentally undemocratic institution, which is bizarre, isn't it? Because adults live most of their lives at work. Five out of seven days, the best hours of the day, you're at work. If you have a commitment to democracy, the first place it should have been instituted is your workplace. Not the last. We live in a country that has never introduced democracy to the workplace. We fight wars in other countries to bring them a democracy we don't have. Right? But it's not as a value that I push it. It's as a solution. What do I mean? Let me give you some examples, and then we're done. Example number one, the question, should the company that's located here in South LA uh, close its shop, lay off 300 workers, and move to Shanghai? The board of directors brings in accountants and economists like me, and we say, wow, you can pay them nothing, those people over there, and so you're going to make much more profit than paying the high wages here in America. And so the board said, wow, make more money, we're gone. And you in, La and in South L.A., oh, live in a tent city down by the river. We don't care. That's not the way the system works. It's profit, and we're going to make more money. Now, imagine a democratic enterprise. You put it up to the 300 workers. Would you like to see your job disappear? <laughs> they have a vote. The conversation lasts for five seconds. <laughs> the vote is held overwhelming. We're not moving. We, we, they would never do it. We wouldn't have had 40 years of exodus of jobs everywhere in this country because it would never have happened. Let me give you another example. Some of you are interested in environment and ecology. Suppose there's a new technology that really fouls the river and pollutes the air. 500 miles away, the board of directors meeting in Chicago or New York or wherever they are, looking down, oh, this two technology is profitable. Yeah, it pollutes the air. <laughs> we don't live there. If workers don't want to breathe that air, go get a job someplace else. They have the power. They institute the technology. You look, pretend it isn't there, breathe deeply, or move. Suppose the workers made the decision. On the one hand, they'd say, well, we want more profit too. But on the other hand, we have to breathe that stuff. And so do our husbands and our wives and our kids and our neighbors. And guess what? A lot of the time, that technology would not be adopted. Not always, but most of the time, those workers would, uh, they would weigh that discussion in a different way from the way a corporation does. And we wouldn't have had half of the pollution that we've had. Let me give you a third and final example. Many of you are concerned, and I have tried to emphasize that this evening, about the inequality that grows in this country. Where does the inequality come from? The inequality in our society comes first and foremost, not from an athlete who jumps high or an actress who makes us cry. Those are exceptions. The basic inequality has to do with how we divide profits. The corporate board of directors does something that's going to come as a real surprise to you. If the decisions in a corporation are made by the tiny number of major shareholders, the ones who hold big blocks of shares, and the board of directors they select, I'm going to give you this surprising result. They take a disproportionate amount of the profits and they give it to themselves. And that's why we have very rich people, because the corporation pays the CEO the kind of money you see in the articles. 40 million, 80 million, 100 million, what difference does it make? It's all kind of monopoly money for them. Monopoly is in the game. That's why we have a tiny number of people with ridiculous amounts of wealth. Now suppose the workers democratically decided what to do with the profits. And their logic would be simple. All the workers helped to produce the profits. That's actually what the CEO says every year at the Christmas party. He thanks all the workers. He gets up on a stage when he isn't too drunk 
to speak. And he said, I want to thank you all, because every one of you, he can't see straight, but every one of you helped to produce the pot. Interesting, if all of us helped, how the hell is it that we're excluded from deciding what to do with what you just congratulated us for helping to produce? In a democratic enterprise, it's a democratic decision what is done with the profits. And guess what? No assembly of workers would give $40 million to four guys, and then everybody else can't send their kid to college because they don't have enough money. It's not going to happen. So if you want to deal with pollution, you want to deal with runaway shops, and you want to deal with inequality, democratize the enterprise because it's the best chance we have to get any of those things done. It means a radical reorganization. And for those of you, and this I promise this really is the last point, other than what comes up in the conversation. For those of you that are skeptical, who are scratching your heads and saying, you really want the janitor to be part of a decision you need a manager for that, a skilled manager. I have taught in business schools. Those of you who have not had a chance to go to a business school have missed exactly nothing. <laughs> a man business schools, MBAs, that's not about teaching you anything all that useful. If you talk to a corporation, they'll tell you. The minute we get a new MBA, we have to train that person into what they do because I don't know what goes on in the MBA. That's a standard joke. I don't know what goes on over there, but you know, well, I'll explain to you. There aren't enough jobs. See, there are not enough jobs for managers. The way too many of you want to be a manager, and there aren't enough. We could have a society that says that to you. We're very sorry. You'd love to be that. Uh, screw you. <laughs> but this is likely to get you upset. Upset at a system that encourages you to study and learn in order to get this job, which we then say we're not going to. It's like telling your jaw, the dog to jump for the biscuit and raising the biscuit each time the dog jumps higher. At a certain point, the dog is going to bite you. <laughs> and this happens with people, too. So we have to come up with a way to distribute too few jobs to all the people who want them, who are qualified to do them, who would be passionate about We have to figure out a way that they won't get angry at their system which has failed to provide them with a job. Solution? Meritocracy. School. University. We are going to make sure that we're going to grade. I'm asked as a professor all my life to grade my students. You are an A. You are a B minus. You are a D. <laughs> What's that for? I don't know enough about the student to give them a grade. I've had to in my classroom for a few weeks. This is ridiculous. And it's offensive. So why do we do it? Because we have to make sure that the employer can give the job to the one with an A. Why? Because the ones with Bs and Cs will then blame themselves for not getting the job rather than the system that has failed to provide them with work. It's a political issue. We want to make sure that those of you who aren't going to get a job because this system has no job for you are instead angry at yourself and will bury yourself in a happy hour because you're so upset. That's all it's about. The reality is it's one of the many mechanisms that takes a failed system and transforms the failure, not of the system, which we could change, but of something in you that's inadequate. It is a cruel form of torture. And those of you that suffer from it, and everyone in this room to some degree has this in their lives. And if you don't think so, you need to think about it some more. The system can be changed. The movement around the world now to change this system is greater than anything I have seen in my lifetime. I have been able in the last little while to talk to you in very profoundly critical ways about capitalism. I'm tempted to end in the way that one of my favorite comedians, George Carlin, used to. While I was talking critically about capitalism, did any lightning come through? Did anybody die? 
You think you'll manage to get home? Is it all such a big deal? Come on. Capitalism is now failing. It's failing the vast majority of people on this planet. It's making a tiny number of people wildly wealthy. Last week we had a report in the New York Times that a milestone was reached. A two-bedroom condo that was sold for over $100 million. For those of you who know, it's Madison Park. Madison and 23rd Street, a tall, slim building. The top four floors uh, are occupied, the top four floors are occupied by Rupert Murdoch. But he's not the one, somebody else paid. He paid less because the prices are going up. This is obscenity. And the mass of people are more open now to understanding this when it's presented fairly clearly, maybe with a little humor, than ever before. It's our job to take that message where we work, where we live, and spread it and try to get people to see what's going on, which they three quarters already do. And then, the big one, get over the anxiety about organization. We won't agree, all of us. We won't 100% trust one another. That's okay. The people in Syriza, I can assure you, I've been to their meeting, they don't all agree and they don't trust each other all that much. And they may blow apart as political groups do, but they are very excited that they have reached a stage they never imagined they would get to. And we should take heart and learn something enormous is going on. Remember that Bob Dylan song? Do you? Do you understand what's going on, or do you not? That's the issue. I haven't told you anything that doesn't tie together things you already knew. But point is, it, it becomes a narrative that really ought to move you to join with other people to make a change. And one last thing. I, I just to be real personal, as I go around the country talking about this, I am having the time of my life <laughs> because I can see everywhere the potential. I can see it in your faces. If we had time, I'd raise a big mirror and want you just tell you, look at yourself. Your faces are beaming. This is, you know, you're part of a moment in history that doesn't come that often. Grab it. Your whole life will be different and that of your children will be way better than what it is now. Thank you very much. We still have a bit of time for Q&A. Obviously in this room, with no mics, you need to speak up if you ask a question. Um, and Sharon has one to just get the ball rolling. Okay, I'm going to start with the first question, and that is that um, a recent study that was co-conducted by Princeton, honey, I'm asking, a recent study conducted by uh, Princeton and Northwestern found that virtual, that uh, average citizens in America have virtually no influence on what happens in our government, and that economic elites and interest groups, especially those represented by business, pretty much call all the shots. So given the results of this study, would you conclude that capitalism, basic capitalism and democracy cannot coexist? Yes, I think that capitalism is in many ways the antithesis of democracy and that the trick, and I'm very respectful of, of, the, of the ideological teaching that this country has been able to work on its behalf, and not just this country. I find it stunning that Americans believe that capitalism virtually is democracy. You know, it, many of my students say that to me, uh, in the light of the fact that it is the antithesis. It's an amazing achievement. It's like uh, convincing people that um, there's no global warming. Yeah. <laughs> or things like that. It, it, but you have to stop and, and be respectful of, of that 
of that capacity. Look what I said. It, it, it really is unrefutable. Nobody I've ever presented this to, and I've presented it to conservative audience. No one can say a word. I describe how a corporation works. Textbook, very simple. Shareholders, board of directors, make all the decisions. You live with it. That job, the factory closes, you're out. The store closes, you're out. You had nothing to do with the decision. You had no rollover, but you have to live with the results. Is that democratic? Nobody raises their hand. Even the most conservative student, they, they, get, they sit there. What they can come back with and what they do is to say, well, somebody has to make the decisions. Can't be everybody. It would be so chaotic. When they do that, I smile. Because that's like the proverbial softball. <laughs> and I can then whack it and look really good. When, when kings used to be confronted by people who didn't want monitors, the king said, there has to be somebody who makes all the decisions. If there weren't a king, if there weren't somebody, the whole society would fall apart. The king is what holds it all together. The king is what intercedes with God for the people. We, you, can't, you couldn't possibly run a society without a king. And then we as a people, we wasn't very nice, but we, we separated the king's lower part from the, <laughs> from the other part. And the other part was rolled into a basket and fed to the cows. And the world didn't end, and civilization didn't crumble. It turned out all we need kings and queens for is ceremonial <laughs> occasions, like the British and the Belgians have, where you trot out these people who live in a funny castle that <laughs> tourists visit. Uh, and other than that, ugh, who needs it? Yeah. So I'm asking you only to say, tell you this story, because this reaction, we have to have somebody in charge of the factory. It's exactly like we have to have somebody be king. We don't need a king in the society, and we don't need a king in the factory or the office of the store either. Where do we get this idea? If democracy works here, it works there. If it's a value of yours, good. And if it isn't, I'll tell you a little story. If it isn't, then let's face what you're saying. You're saying you don't care about democracy in the workplace. You want a king. You think that's the only, okay, put it out there. And let's see how the mass of workers feel about you as the king. Just say it honestly. I'm willing to fight on that battle because I'll beat you on that. The workers don't want a king any more than the mass of people wanted a king. On January 20th, I was invited, another sign, to Yale University by the Yale Political Union. That's an old, established uh, debating society. They have seven different groupings of politically active students. On the right, I kid you not, they call themselves the Tories. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> on the left, I forget what the furthest left, I mean, progressive or leftist or something like that. And then everything in between. And they invited me to debate because they invite people to come and debate, uh, people from the outside, to support a proposition. Uh, the two that they mentioned to me as having come earlier in the semester than me was, and you'll like this, Rick Santorum. <laughs> I don't know what the proposition was that he defended, and Camille Paglia whom some of you should know is uh, anti-feminist. Feminist is coming. Uh, so I'm in that line, which is a strange line, but I'm in that line. So here's the proposition. Yale students came up with this. Across the spectrum, the large banks in the United States should be nationalized and taken over by the government. So A, that was their idea, not mine. And B, even more interesting, they, of all the people in the world, they picked me to come and to defend the proposition. So I went and I gave my talk. And then there was shouting and arguing back and forth. And the way they do it, at the end of three hours of debating, people vote. Those that are left in the room vote. The vote was 32 in favor of nationalizing the banks, 29 against the motion carried at Yale, <laughs> where half the people in the room probably are related. <laughs> so, these are signs of change. 
and I was as clear there as I was tonight. Democracy doesn't have to do with capitalism. You know, when the French Revolution came, the French Revolution had those slogans, liberty, equality, fraternity. And the argument was, if you get rid of feudalism, if you bring in capitalism, it'll bring with it liberty, equality, and fraternal brotherhood. French. Liberté, égalité, fraternity. Okay, those are the three. Karl Marx, that was why he was important. He arrives in 1850, half a century later. And Marx says, we've been betrayed. Capitalism came in, but it's not producing liberty, equality, and fraternity. I love the French Revolution, he said, but it didn't deliver. And as I look at it, he says, here's the problem. Capitalism is not only not the deliverer of liberty, equality, and fraternity, it is now the biggest obstacle to achieving it. That's his project. So yes, democracy, and for me, is the antithesis. So let me, the so lady in orange in the back. So um, when um, Roosevelt brought in Social Security, he had 284 votes, Democratic votes, and that's how he got it in. Okay. Obama struggled with getting 206 votes to get Obama there. It's a barely getting through. Okay. So don't we have to get money out of politics? Oh. Right. <laughs> it would be lovely. But for me to ask you, for me to say get money out of politics is... I don't know, I can't think of a metaphor that would capture it. That's not going to happen. The solution, if you go that with them, they'll go that. That's the history of all of this. We've tried to control money in politics from day one, and we've basically failed. We, you, we watch as the people who were involved in controlling it are hired by the people because they know what to do to get around it. And they do, and then a new crop of government officials come in and try to plug that hole. Meanwhile, they've developed it. The, the solution is to democratize the enterprise. Because if we didn't give some people a wild amount of money relative to others, the issue is solved. Look, the most successful example of a dem democratized enterprise in the world right now is a factory and an office and an, an enormous enterprise in Spain. Some of you have heard of it. It's called Mondragon. Yeah. Very important. In 1956, a Catholic priest, Father Arismendi, for those of you who know about the Bay Area, you'll know that there are a bunch of bakeries in the Bay Area called Arismendi. That's why it's called Arismendi, because the name of the priest who begins this process in Spain is a Father Arismendi. It's a terribly poor part. It's the Basque country in the low hills of the Pyrenees, the border between France and Spain. This is a very poor area, devastated in the Spanish Civil War, and then devastated as a result of World War II. So in 1956, this is as poor as you get in Europe. And the priest says to six of the workers that are in his parish in this terribly poor area, he makes a joke. If we wait until some capitalist comes to provide us with work, We'll all die of old age before that happens. So here's what we should do. Let's be our own boss. Let's set up a workers' cooperative. Six workers and a priest. Fast forward to 2015. The Mondragon Cooperative Corporation is a, 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 a parent of about 250 co-ops. They now employ 100 thousand workers. They're the seventh largest corporation in Spain. Here's one of the rules they adopt. The highest paid worker cannot get more than eight times <coughs> the lowest paid worker. In American large corporations, the highest paid CEO is typically paid 300 times the lowest paid worker. So what have they done? And by the way, it's been this way for years and years. It works fine. They're a very successful company. If you ever have a chance to go to the, I mean this, they have a wonderful program to take visitors through, to show you, you can meet with the workers, talk with them. It's a very well articulated operation. They have their own university, it's called the Mondragon University, it has four campuses. 
They teach courses in how to organize a worker co-op and how to finance it and how to handle technical problems. They have their own research labs. They're so advanced in the research labs that two American, I like to tell Americans this, two American corporations pay them so that the corporation scientists can work alongside of them in the labs there so they can pick up the technology. The name of the two American corporations, General Motors and Microsoft. <laughs> they're, they're in good shape. Then you don't have this. If the, if the people are close to one another in their income, and they allow differences for various reasons, they give some workers more than others, but you're never going to get this kind of situation in that kind of relationship, then you don't have to have 47 laws that don't work to control something that you shouldn't have let, allowed there in the first place. That's the problem. It's awful. For example, both of my hosts here were telling me, and, and Miguel as well, about the gentrification problem here in, in, in Los Angeles, the sort of destroying of the older and poorer neighborhoods. And it, what is that? It's capitalism. Of course, the people with the money calculated by a business only in terms of what it has to spend. It looks only at its costs relative to its profits. If those are good, it does it. But that means that a lot of other costs that it doesn't have to worry about, it, it doesn't have to account for. But we as a society have to live with them. And if we added those, it wouldn't be profitable at all. The costs of what they just did, when you add up all the social costs, was way better than the profit they shouldn't have done that. Here, I'll give you one example. Simple. It's called Detroit. <laughs> it's Detroit. And by the way, if it's true of Detroit, it's true of Cleveland and Camden, New Jersey, and of my hometown. I was born in Youngstown, Ohio. Another disaster. Total disaster. That was nuts what we did there. If you go to D Detroit, if you haven't, go. It's like looking at what, what I imagined Beirut was after the bomb. It's a wasteland. It's a disaster. And what was created that disaster? One thing. Capitalist enterprises who decide, called Ford, Chrysler, and General Motors, who decided they could make more money someplace else. And they got up and they left. These are industries that went from nothing, very small companies to make. Along the way, they got tax breaks from, from Detroit, they got tax breaks from Michigan, they got tax breaks from the United States. They got subsidies, they got technical help. They got every, at our expense, the people. But when they decided to leave, they just went. Did we say, oh, wait a minute, Jack. You can't go because we've pumped money into you. You want to pay us back? Well, then we can talk about your going. But you're not just going. I want to remind you, in 2008 and 9, we, the American people, through our taxes, provided a subsidy to General Motors of 50 billion dollars. Otherwise, that company wouldn't be here. We'd be like Lehman Brothers, a vague memory. So we permit capitalism to function at our expense in a way that staggers the mind once you begin to allow yourself to think about it. So it's a contradiction of democracy on many levels. Mm -hmm. Is that lady in red? Thank you. I have a big concern that consumers in America are buying all the products that are coming out of China. And I've been trying, I've been with different groups that have been trying for years to educate people, but it's completely overwhelming. So when you're, so the model that you're talking about, say somewhere in South, South uh, LA, where there's a company that's got 300 employees, and they decide not to move their uh, company to China, how are they going to stay competitive if all That's a wonderful question. Very and, good. And as a consumer, how, at what point are we going to take responsibilities for buying the things that we value? Because we're going to have to buy them from China or buying them from China. Those are two very different questions. Those are two very different questions. So let me try to deal with the first one. The rationale that uh, we can't compete, a, a, a worker cooperative or that kind of thing can't compete, the rationale, the idea of that, uh, originated with all of the folks who basically react to the notion of a worker cooperative as though it is unworkable, that it is some kind, 
again, I want to remind, like in the days of struggle against monarchy, that a society without a king is an unworkable social arrangement. Now, I want to break you from the habit. Now, let me be concrete. In a, in a regular capitalist enterprise, there's always a problem. Why? Because the boss, you all know this because you've worked in them or you know people who have. The boss is always in the following relationship to the worker. If you're the boss, you want to get more out of the worker and give him less. And the worker very quickly understands that the name of the game for him or her is to get as much out of you as possible and spend the maximum amount of time imaginable in the bathroom. <laughs> Smoking things, you know, you know, you know. This is called a fundamental opposition of interests. It is a bizarre way of organizing production by putting people who don't trust and hate and struggle against each other. And you know what it does? It produces lots of grotesque inefficiency. You know what the word sabotage comes from? It's a French word. Sabot is a wooden shoe in French. What the Dutch people here think it's Dutch people, but French people use them too. And if a worker was angry at the boss, which he usually is, what he would do is take the sabot and stick it in the machine, messing it up. And that's called sabotage. That's why you have that word. Okay? Workers are always doing that kind of thing because they're angry. Bosses know that. In fact, bosses usually assume you're angry at them, even if you are. <laughs> and then they spend a lot of money hiring people, like my wife as a psychotherapist, to come up with what kind of music to pipe into the workplace to distract you from the anger they think you feel. There's an enormous industry in this country called industrial psychology, which is how to manipulate your work. You know why? Because workers, guess what? That wastes resources, it wastes time. It means that the employer has to hire for every four workers two supervisors. They don't make anything, they just bother you. <laughs> That's not efficient. We need those people to be making things, not bothering the people. Guess what? In a workers' cooperative, there isn't a contradiction between the worker and the boss, because the workers are the boss. That produces all kinds of technical efficiencies. This is not, I promise you, this is not complicated. The only reason it may come to you as a new piece of news is because you've lived in a society that doesn't want to talk about these things, wants to act as though the capitalist way of organizing things is the only reasonable way. It's a little bit like talking to a slave master in a plantation. How do you organize production? And he would explain to you, well, there's got to be some people with whips and a, what? <laughs> What? But he can't think beyond the slave thing that he's caught in. You gotta be careful not, I don't mean this personally, you gotta be careful not to be caught in the logic of a capitalism which constantly justifies itself as if it's the only and the best thing. I teach in an economic. Half of my colleagues spend half of their lives proving 800 is the most efficient. You'd think it's the old Shakespeare remark, you know, you protest too much, <laughs> you're working too hard, must be something wrong with what you're saying, because nobody who was comfortable would have to repeat it so many times. We, it's, it's like listening to our politicians. This is the greatest country. If it was the greatest country, you wouldn't have to say it all the time. What are you doing? You're, you're actually revealing that you're insecure about it. The Mondragon Corporation, when it went from six workers to 100,000, had to compete with hundreds, thousands of capitalist corporations. In those competitions, Mondragon won and they lost. Why? Because Mondragon was more efficient. Does that mean co-ops are always more efficient? No. Some co-ops are more, some are. But intrinsically, there's an in principle, no problem. There are advantages to a co-op enterprise that a capitalist one doesn't have, and there are some advantages that a capitalist enterprise has that a co-op doesn't have. For example, a capitalist enterprise with a single manager or owner can make a quick decision. It would take more time for a co-op. It's true. It's a little bit like a king can make a quick decision. A parliament babbles a lot. But we've kind of decided in modern history 
we rather the babble. Given the decisions the king made so fast, better to babble. <laughs> and so it is with corporations. They're very fast, and boy, do they disappear quickly. And maybe it'd be better for us to take our time. All I'm saying at this point is, don't assume that there's something about capitalist corporations that makes them better. It really, it, that's what feudal lords said about feudal manners. That's what slave people said about plantation. Every society justifies what it has until it's overthrown and people discover there's something better. That's a point. So Sharon and I and, and all the team that put this together are deeply grateful to, to Dr. Wolf.